Let's begin with a Lutheran preacher, Richard Kemmerer. In his book, Preaching for the Church, writes, It, preaching, is not strictly speaking to inform, but to empower toward goals and ends. Let's break this down. Empowerment derives from the gospel of baptism. Goals and ends refer to the Christian life. Kemmerer once wrote, Preaching imparts information and teaching, certainly, but its fact and teaching is a means toward further ends. Homiletics in the 1950s encountered several shifts, from an emphasis upon information to transformation from thematic propositional sermons that focused on teaching to creative, inductive sermons that focused on experience. From sermons on content being conveyed and minds being filled to sermons on experiences being generated and lives being changed. Kemmerer wrote when the sermon was being transformed from a propositional lecture to a charismatic event. Kemmerer encouraged sermons to include a goal, a malady, and a means. For our purposes, we will employ holy baptism as our means, and failing to employ baptismal gifts as our malady. Kemmerer divided goals into two parts. Faith goals reach up to God, and life goals reach out to your neighbor. We will accordingly make our goal living the baptized life, both toward God and our neighbor. Kemmerer and C.F.W. Walther taught the frequent interplay of law and gospel. The emphasis is on the words frequent interplay. It is not law, then gospel. For this reason, Kemmerer bemoaned preachers who distorted goal malady means into sermon outlines. He wanted to preserve the freedom of arrangement so the preachers would not be constrained to make every sermon sound the same, moving from one part, law, malady, to one part gospel means, to the last part application goal. Instead, every sermon would be different, arising from the text. Here is a section of a sermon on John 3, 1 through 10. My goal is that the hearers will bounce back after falling into sin. My malady is that too often we quit and give up. My means, of course, is to rejoice in the statement, I am baptized. As I read these statements, please fill in the blanks. Here we go. I'm at the end of my rope. I'm ready to throw in the towel. I'm just a bundle of nerves. My life is falling apart. I'm at my wit's end. I feel like resigning from the human race. I have good news for you. When sin has its way with us and we feel like quitting, throwing in the towel at the end of our rope, Jesus says we can bounce back. Listen to what he tells a man named Nicodemus. I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. John 3, verse 5. We can bounce back because we are born again by water and the Spirit. And what's that called? Holy baptism. Water and the Spirit first appear together in Genesis 1, verse 2. The Spirit of God was moving over the water. The Holy Spirit moves over the water, creating life. Just so, the Holy Spirit moves over the water when we're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what is the Spirit doing? The Holy Spirit is creating new life, a life that bounces back after setbacks and downturns, after defeats and disappointments, after sin and shame. Do you know the most quoted Bible verse in America? God helps those who help themselves. There's a problem with that, though. It's not in the Bible. God doesn't help those who help themselves. God knows we can't help ourselves. God knows that he has to do 100% of the work. That's why Jesus uses the word born eight times in John chapter 3, 3 through 10. Eight times 
in eight verses. How active were you when you were born? Were you in radio communication with your mother telling her when to push? Did the doctor ask you to measure the contractions and report from inside the womb? Did you place your hands against the top of the womb and push yourself out? Postpartum celebrations applaud the work of the mother, not the child. Mom gets a medal, the child gets a pacifier. Here's my point. We were all passive when we were born. We didn't do a thing. We weren't born because of what we did. Our mother did all the work in the same way. God does all the work for our spiritual birth. Born again by water and the Spirit means that God does 100% of the work, which means we can bounce back. How can this be? Nicodemus asked, John 3, verse 9. Start all over? Bounce back because you're baptized? Nonsense. Jesus responds in John 3, verse 10. You are Israel's teacher. And do you not understand these things? As Israel's teacher, Nicodemus should have understood that the Old Testament is all about bouncing back. Abraham worshiped the moon. God called him to bless the world. Moses killed a man. God called him to lead his people out of Egypt. Aaron built a golden calf. God called Aaron to be Israel's first high priest. Jeremiah 31, 31 promises a new covenant. Ezekiel 36, 26 promises a new heart. Lamentations 3, verse 23 promises that God's mercies are new every morning. When you feel like giving up, giving in, and giving out, remember that you're baptized. You have the power. <laughs> you have the power to bounce back. The goal is not to quit. The malady is that too often we throw in the towel because we're at our wit's end and we feel like resigning from the human race. And the means to bouncing back, holy baptism. Another homiletician, Thomas Long, shares Kemmerer's concern about transformation, but employs different terms. Long uses the words focus and function. He writes, what the sermon aims to say can be called its focus. And what the sermon aims to do can be called its function. Aims to say equals Kemmerer's malady and means. Aims to do equals Kemmerer's goal. The focus is what the sermon is all about. The function is what the pastor hopes the sermon will accomplish for the hearers. Long writes, the focus statement is a message to say. The function statement is a deed to do. Just like baptized in life. Both focus and function connect with each other. Again, Long writes, they should be a matched pair, one growing out of the other. And they should be clear, unified, and relatively simple. Not simplistic, mind you, but simple. Uh, we need fewer simplistic sermons and many more simple sermons. Here is one of Long's examples of being too complex, focus. Now, as in the very beginning, the leadership of the church and its mission grow out of the prayers of Christ. Function, to encourage a spirit of openness in the church by enabling the hearers to see that Christ calls many different kinds of people into service. Can you see how confusing and muddled this is? Keep it simple. Baptism is the focus and life is the function. For example, Focus, baptized into Christ, I have a new identity as his heir. Function, I see myself as Christ sees me. Here is part of a sermon on Titus 3, 5 through 7. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. As a child, 
One of my favorite family rituals every summer was going to Elitch Gardens in Denver, Colorado. The park had all kinds of rides and enough sticky cotton candy to amaze my little life. But what fascinated me the most were the fun house mirrors. Some mirrors would make me look tall and skinny. Others would make me look fat and short. Still others would make me look ugly and creepy. None of the mirrors reflected who I really was. And neither do the mirrors that surround us. Just turn on the television, surf the net, go to the mall, pick up a magazine. There we see perfect people with perfect families, in perfect marriages, delighting in perfect jobs. When these images seductively summon us into gazing into their glass, what do we see? We see all the time that we don't measure up. You name it, we don't have it. Addicted to how the world sees us, we begin feeling tall and skinny, short and fat, ugly and creepy. If we look into these mirrors long enough, we begin to languish, lose hearts, and feel absolutely worthless. When we feel worthless, we not only discount ourselves, we begin discounting everyone else. You name them, we discount them. Spouse, child, colleague, pastor, parent, boss. When we feel like nothing, we treat other people like they're nothing. We sell each other off for cut rate prices. Slashing and burning reputations, obsessed with what we don't have, we get stuck in the game of gossip, the silent stares, the jungle of judgment. Is there a better way? You bet there is. Paul tells us in Titus chapter 3 that Jesus saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. When did that happen? That happened when we were baptized. Holy baptism, Paul says, saves, washes, regenerates, renews, and justifies. Holy baptism also gives us a new identity. A Paul holds up another mirror. Let's look at this mirror closely. It says we are, Titus 3 again, heirs according to the hope of eternal life. As heirs, we are part of the family, God's family. We are his sons and daughters. And as his heirs, we have an inheritance, the hope of eternal life. I am who God says I am. I'm God's child and heir. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor executed on April 9th, 1945, by order of Heinrich Himmler, the head of the German Nazi SS and Gestapo. They stripped Bonhoeffer naked and put a wire, not a rope, around his neck and hung him. Days before his death, Bonhoeffer composed a famous poem now called Wer bin ich, or... Who am I? Toward the end of the poem, Bonhoeffer writes, Who am I? It mocks me, this lonely question of mine. Whoever I am, O oh God, I am yours. Wer bin ich? Who am I? It mocks me, this lonely question of mine. Who am I? Paul says, I am an heir a baptized, heaven-bound child of the king. Wer bin ich? Who am I? Whoever I am, O oh God. I am yours forever. Why is that? I am baptized. This sermon has a simple focus and a simple function, but it is not simplistic. In his book, Christ-Centered Preaching, Brian Chappell says that every preacher has to have one question at the top of the list. So what? Chapel writes, the message too often remains uncooked without thoughtful, true-to-the-text application. 
A grammar lesson is not a sermon. A sermon is not a textual summary, a systematics discourse, or a history lesson. Preachers who cannot answer a so what will preach a who cares sermon. We are not ministers of information. We are ministers of Christ's transformation. You might ask, what does Chapel say about what Kemmerer calls goals, what Long calls function, and what Lutherans call the third use of the law, that is, the baptized life? For openers, Chapel notes that preachers make a fundamental mistake when they assume that by providing biblical information, people will automatically make the connection between scriptural truth and their everyday lives. He quotes from David Verman, who says, Simply stated, application is answering two questions. So what and now what? The first question asks, why is this passage important to me? The second asks, what should I do about it today? To summarize, Kemmerer helps us with goal, malady, and means. Long's focus and function add a different nuance to our same objective, preaching the baptized life. Chapel's contribution is so what and now what? At the same time, Chapel warns us about messages that are not Christ-centered or redemptively focused. They promote what he calls the deadly bees. Under this category, we have bee-like messages, which stress that listeners must strive to be like a particular biblical personality. We also have be-good messages, which assume that believers can secure their relationship with God by adopting right behavior. We just need to be good. There are also be disciplined messages that urge believers to improve their relationship with God by trying harder. All such messages, says Chapel, are deadly because they assume we're able to do something ourselves about our fallen condition. They bypass baptism. More than ever, Chapel also reviews three common types of applications that are unhelpful. He calls the first pie-in-the-sky principles. Smile more every hour. Resolve never to fear again. These applications make it sound as though the pastor lives in a make-believe world. High hurdles. You should learn Greek and Hebrew so that you can really learn the truth of God's Word. Everyone here should resolve to go to the Holy Land and walk where Jesus walked. Neurofocus. You should buy this book and read it from cover to cover. You should sign up for this 16-week seminar to learn how to manage your money. Here is an example of Christ-centered preaching that takes us into the baptized life while avoiding chapel's pitfalls. This is a portion of a sermon on Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. In Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, Paul takes what happened to Jesus, our Savior's death, resurrection, and ascension, events that he describes in Ephesians chapter 1, and applies it to us. Baptized into Christ, what happened to Jesus now happens to us. He was dead, our old life is dead. He's alive, now we're alive. He sits in the heavenly realms. We sit in the heavenly realms. His body is perfect, and the day is most certainly coming when our entire body, mind, and heart will be made altogether perfect. We need these gifts. Oh God, we need these gifts more than we'll ever know. That's how Paul begins Ephesians chapter 2. He writes, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdoms of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. Paul says we go downhill all the way in the first three verses of Ephesians 2. Dead, disobedient, depraved, and doomed. We need a 100% full body makeover from head to toe. Our eyes are full of envy. Our mouth is full of gossip and slander. Our heart is full of revenge and resentment. 
Our hands are full of bitterness and blaming. We are all one huge, massive spiritual train wreck. Paul goes on in Ephesians 2, but, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Did you catch that? But, but God loves us when we are deep in sin and don't know and don't care. But God is rich in mercy when we are dead, disobedient, depraved, and doomed. But God reaches out when we are stubborn fools and liars to ourselves. God showers us with gifts of love, mercy, grace, and resurrection. And it happened, it happened when we were baptized. If you've ever wanted to live in a castle, here's your chance. Ireland has castles for sale each priced at about one U.S. dollar. There's a catch, however. According to a New York Times article, the historic structures are in advanced stages of disrepair, and buyers must restore each property, quote, consistent with its historical architecture. Estimates for restoration of these castles run from $7 million to about $30 million apiece. Buying a fixer-upper gives us a picture of what God has done for each of us. We were dead, disobedient, depraved, and doomed. But when we were baptized, we were delivered. God could have said, I'll make all new things the old won't do. But, there's that word again, but, God instead said, I'll make all things new, even and especially you. Paul goes on in Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Baptized. We think godly thoughts. Baptized, we do godly things. Baptized, we choose godly priorities. Baptized, we make godly choices with our time, our money, and our lives. Through baptism, God has recreated us for good works. Through baptism, God has made all things new, even (laughs) and especially you. (laughs) 